and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, making his way back here for the first time in two years. The he the head of Adderstone Games, and the and the creator of Legends of Avalon, which is getting it, which is getting its first full campaign in the f in the form of Against the Fairy Queen, spelled with an E, just just <laughs> just so just so that everybody makes sure we're not messing around. The one and only Darren Ozturk. How are you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred, I'm doing very well, thank you. And thank your intro has got more. Uh... I think it's got wilder since uh, two years ago, that's for sure. Well, I've, I've had more practice. Yeah, excellent. Okay. I, I, checked, I checked the playlist. I've done, a, I, I've done a total of over 600 interviews since I started this endeavor. Nice. That's fantastic. Oh. So how, how have you been holding up? It's been like two years since I had you on. Yeah, yeah, it's been excellent. So last time you had me, we were doing the Kickstarter campaign for our original card-based uh, Celtic Roman fantasy RPG set in the mythical Roman Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and that went great. And then since then, uh, obviously, we made the game. We uh, released it. We got a uh, publishing and distribution deal with Modiphius, which is mm -hmm. the, the biggest um, UK RPG publisher distributor. And I'm sure they're known in the States as well. I think they do. Oh, and, and, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've I've known about them since the day I've known about uh, Modiphius in one form or another since the days of um, of them bringing Conan back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, so we managed to sign with them, which was really great. Um, and now Legends of Avalon has been distributed to retail stores in uh, the US and in the UK, mm -hmm. which is super awesome. Uh, so yeah, we released the game. Uh, reviews are good, and now we are come back for. Uh, a, a campaign book set in uh, Avalon, our fantasy room in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, that's currently on Kickstarter now. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's. I guess that's that's all of two years. I mean, other things have happened in my life, I'm sure. Uh, but when it comes to Adderstone Games, uh, the, 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 that's that's the footnotes. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to the when it comes to this 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 um, campaign book. Mm -hmm. um, and while, while I will I will dip into the five e five e um, end of things, I will mostly be focusing on the av on the Avalon end of things. Yeah, for sure. Just because I got I got to follow through the set, the setup that I had two years ago. Okay. But was this was this a how how did the origin story of Against the Fairy Queen come about? Was this was this something that you had in the back burner notes um, in the early days of Avalon or? What or did it, did it come to life in a more recent form? Um, I guess. Well, we can talk about two things. There is one is like the the book itself and, and what's going to be inside it. The other mm -hmm. thing is like the concept of making the book in the first place. Um, and for the making the book in the first place, it was always so. Legends of Avalon was my first game, and I know what it's like to be a game master and have like a regular job and want to play things on the side and wanting to have modules to help you run things. And for me as a game designer, it felt strange for me to put a game out there without having content to play with it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was always in my mind that, yes, I want to make a game and I wanted to make a campaign book. And then for me, that's the complete package, right? You can buy the Legends of Ireland book and you can buy the Against the Fairy Queen campaign book and then you have a, uh, a complete game that you, you can play and run uh, that will last uh, months. Um, so for me, it was always a goal that I wanted to release a campaign book for the RPG, because uh, otherwise, in my mind, the RPG wasn't complete in a way. So if there wasn't any published material for it as well, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that was my thinking there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with with that with that in mind, you ha you you have it set up that this has this this has support for Avalon as well as Five um, E. Yeah. And I will admit, whenever I, whenever I see um, games that are do, that are doing um, two system support, um, mm -hmm. and I'm not I'm not putting you in the same category as this, but something that always comes to mind is 
second edition Legend of the Five Rings when they when they tried it. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> which is like even though there were some interesting advancements in second edition L five R, it's generally treated in as as a we don't talk about that kind of thing because they tried to they tried to support both the third both third edition D twenty. And mm-hmm. the roll and keep system in the same books. So, but uh, were they trying to combine the rule systems together? No, they were trying. To, they they were trying to do. They were trying to do both in the same books, and it it didn't work out for them. <laughs> right. Okay. Um. So f- for you, for you, one of the questions that I that I have is um is is have you got have you taken steps to make sure that the 5e parts don't bleed into the Avalon parts and vice versa with the book? Yeah, so, I mean, w- we made a proof of concept um, to make sure this was even viable. Um, we released a prologue adventure um, that's set in Avalon that's for Legends of Avalon and for 5th edition. Um, and that was, wasn't just a proof of concept for uh, for for backers as well as for our, our own sake, like we wanted to know: is this possible? Can we make this work? Uh, are we happy with the outcome? Um, are we confident in putting it out there? Uh, and then the answer ended up being yes. So the, the way it works for us is that the campaign book itself, the story, the the quest branches, the the characters, the arcs, uh, the monsters, the fiends, um, all the stuff is is system um, system agnostic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just when it comes down to what the players do and how the system um, handles that is where the differences lie um, and how that ends up playing out with an actual adventure book at least for ours anyway is it mostly just means that when some kind of action takes place we have two different difficulty checks uh, that's fine and when the rules get particular we just have a footnote uh, for the differences that there might be for 5th edition we, we put Legends of Arlen as the main system that we assume you're running the campaign book with and then we have little adaptations for 5e. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the biggest um, the biggest part that it intrudes on, I would say, um, is that we have to have two stat blocks for each NPC uh, and creature. But I say intrusion, that just ends up meaning that we just have one stat block and another stat block next to it. It's not really uh, that big of a deal or eyesore, in my opinion. Um, the other actual main issue that... <laughs> um, that I've really found was just a, a lack of systems or a lack of systems that people like in fifth edition for the kinds of Celtic adventures that I want to take players and game masters on that involve like uh, journeys and a lot of diplomacy and that kind of thing. Um, whereas Legends of Ireland has systems, uh, rule systems for these uh, kinds of uh, quests and challenges. Uh, they're not so pronounced in fifth edition. So it ends up being, well, do we just leave it and just let people that are running 5th edition figure it out for themselves or hand wave it? But we ended up deciding, no, we're going to adapt some of the Legends of Arlen systems into 5th edition instead. So it's kind of more, rather than adapting our system to 5th edition, we're going the other way and kind of forcing ourselves on, <laughs> onto them um, and uh, hoping that they enjoy it. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, with now, um, with that with that in mind, obviously there's a there's a lot of a lot of a lot of angles that can be taken with that can be taken with a module and with a with a campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had if you had to if you had to set up a primer for a, for a set of new players regarding regarding the adventure that is against the fairy queen, um, mm-hmm. what sort of what sort of what sort of campaign themes would you would you emphasize to them? Okay, so this is a fantastical version of Celtic Roman Britain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a land of um, warrior queens, druidic kings, an invading empire, um, the other world, which is like a parallel realm that you can stumble into while wandering through a forest that's full of fey demons, uh, spirits, gods, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and in this place, there's there's all sorts of politics going on. There's the new empire, new cultures, new laws being instilled into the south of the island. There are the clans to the north that are resisting. Uh, 
want to keep the old ways. There are the clans of the south that have kind of adapted um, and allied themselves with the invaders. Um, there's all this going on, and then amongst it, the fairy queen is returned, mm-hmm. and she is a legendary figure that was once a hero um, of a time period called the Sorrows. This was a time when the gods were at war with each other. Um, she was a hero then, but now she's returned as a scourge. She's she's uh, wrathful, and people don't know why. Uh, what is it that's been done? Who's wronged her? What is it that she wants to achieve? Um, and it's the hero's jobs to find out what's what's happened, the cause uh, of her return, and fundamentally to stop her because her her ends are not good for mortals. Let's put it that way. Um, and the campaign itself is kind of has another side to it as well. We really wanted to hit on some really iconic archetypes. Um, mm-hmm. So there's there's five adventures in the campaign, and they're kind of clearly deline- delineated. Um, and set within like a really strong theme. So the first one's the hunt. Um, and this is the hunt for what we call a faith drug. This is a demonic being, a boar, a giant boar that's escaped from the other world. Um, and it's your job to hunt it down to save a historic wedding. Um, and that's all about, it's all inspired by like the Witcher, Monster Hunter, those kind of series. And that's kind of the gameplay that we're shooting for there. Um, mm-hmm. And, and another thing to note as well is that each of these adventures are very much strongly inspired by a real uh, Celtic legend, um, or more than one, in fact. Um, so this one's inspired by um, Coluch and Olwyn, um, mm-hmm. which is uh, a legend about hunting a boar to, uh, to uh, create a, allow a wedding to happen. Um, the other adventures include The Heist, so this is Assassin's Creed, Ocean's Eleven, mm-hmm. um, that kind of thing. Uh, this is you uh, sneaking into a um, guarded compound in the heart of a Raxian city uh, to steal an artifact. Um, so really upping just just everything you mentioned about a heist genre. That's what we want to put into this uh, mm-hmm. this quest. Uh, then we have the horror, which you can imagine what that's about. Um, mm-hmm. And that's very much inspired by Lovecraft and uh, Majora's Mask Zelda. Yep. Um, and then we have the games. This is our kind of diplomatic, political... Uh, quest uh, where you'll be competing in games and scheming in politics um, at a kind of like clan summit uh, that's occurring. Um, and then finally, we have the Cairn. This is our finale. This is um, an epic dungeon. This is just like a classic delving into a dungeon, master puzzles, defeat bosses, and then uh, stop the fairy queen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what you get yourself into. You get yourself into Celtic fantasy inspired by real Celtic legends. And then each quest has a really strong uh, archetypical theme that we really wanted to hit hard that we knew people uh, would find exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will admit when you when you said when you said the horror the um, the mm-hmm. sm- the smart ass brain part of my brain wanted to say that it was based on Apocalypse Now. <laughs> oh, interesting. Why'd you say that? Um, for what for one being for one being a film buff and t- two. Mm-hmm. Um, the the inf- the infamous speech about horror in in that film and three um knowing how much of a horror show the actual development of the film was <laughs> which i i joke about but call calling calling the development of the film apocalypse now a shit show is a um insult to shit shows <laughs> <laughs> okay well <laughs> okay I can, uh, can't say, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no inspiration there. I'll say it's not in our notes. No, <laughs> no. Uh, but with a lot of the ones that you mentioned, barring the, barring the final one, are they meant to be, are they meant to be played in a set order or could they be, could they be shifted around as the GM wishes? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the first one, the hunt that, I mean, yes, the, the first one, the hunt is the first quest. Um, and, uh, I guess some slight spoilers is to, there's a, there's a big, big, important wedding involved, um, that the rampaging boar is preventing from happening. Um, and then perhaps if the heroes are successful or maybe they're not, who knows, um, you'll be able to meet some of the powerful figures at the wedding. And that kind of sets up the other quests, um, allowing you to, uh, have connections to other parts of, of Arlen. Um, because all these quests take place in different areas of of of, of the island, um, 
And so that's your way into meeting people. Um, so yeah, the next three quests, the heist, which is in the Raxian city to the south, the horror, which will be in the northern Misty Isles, um, and the games, which will be in the, the mountains in the north middle of the islands. Though all those three quests can be done in any order. Um, mm -hmm. And the order that you do in them in will also influence the, the, the quest that you save till, till last, as it were, um, uh, which will be exciting. Uh, and then the final quest, the current, that is at the end. So it's kind of like a, uh, a branching in the middle and then uh, joining back in for the final quest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with taking, taking that into, into account, um, now, obvi obviously, with with some games, you can you can kind of build you can kind of build around a le a level a level tier. But given that Avalon is a bit more freeform, mm -hmm. um, how, how do you is how do you build this so that you so that you don't have people um, being a bit being a bit being a bit under underpowered for the for what the campaign is asking? Um, yeah. So we the way I view um, RPGs and I, and I guess game design for Legends of Avalon, but it also applies to fifth, fifth edition as well. Is that I think about it in like level brackets, as it were. I don't think of a quest as being this is for level five. Um, I imagine all the quests being for level four to seven, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and that means some challenges will be more difficult than others, depending on what stage you are in that level bracket. Um, but that is part of the fun of RPGs in, in my mind. Sometimes you will be underleveled for an encounter, and that's up to you as players to figure out how to overcome this foe or maybe even avoid them uh, if you're at this stage of the game. And then when you come over across a similar challenge when you're later level, then you'll feel the empowerment of being much stronger and being able to overcome them. Um, so, of course, I mean, there'll be playtesting involved as well to make sure it's not too extreme. Um, but that's also one of the reasons why that we had to have the first quest be uh, set in stone. Originally, we were going to do uh, the first four quests um, uh, could be done in any order. Uh, but really, as we know, we need, we need to have a, a beginning that is the same for everyone that can uh, introduce the world, uh, introduce the quest, and introduce the difficulty. And then having a little bit of flexibility in the middle um, once we've uh, set you up to that level um uh we yeah we don't believe there'll be any issues really um in uh running those in any order yeah uh it's all about giving the players opportunity to overcome greater challenges uh through cunning um, mm -hmm. which is uh, a big part of celtic legends yeah uh, yeah now there is one there is one type of obstacle, if, in, if encounter is too strong a word, that some that um, some GMs have a, have a fair amount of arguing about about whether or not it should be utilized in tabletop or not, and that is the use of puzzles. Um, mm -hmm. How how do you feel about how do you feel about puzzles in TTRPGs, and have you put in plans on do on doing any puzzle like encounters for against the Fairy Queen? Yeah, so. Um, I, I don't know, I, I want to call myself pro puzzle, although the kind of puzzles that I like to include in my games aren't the kinds where I want the players to get out a pen of paper and start writing things down and shifting and drawing stuff, that kind of thing. I prefer the puzzles to be, uh, more like environmental challenges inside game. Um, itself, kind of, if you've played Breath of the Wild, mm -hmm. um, kind of like the uh, like mini dungeons they have in there, where uh, you look around the environment and see and figure out how things interact with each other, and then it's by interacting with the environment itself you can get through the puzzle. They're the kind of ones that I aspire to create, and then really because of that, there's usually there's more than one solution as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, once there's a setup. And a lot of those puzzles, well, you can always brute force if you really need to, um, which uh, I think can be important as well. Because in the end, when 
it's not i mean you say brute force as if that sounds like a bad thing well so i say brute force like it's a bad thing but it's not really um because you can't just brute force i mean okay if you can brute force a puzzle in any way then that's a problem but if you can brute force it in a certain way then that's just another solution do you see what i mean um and once the players come up with their solution it doesn't matter what it is even if it does involve some force that's still the solution and that's empowered them to solve the puzzle in however way that they've determined um mm -hmm. so they're the kind of puzzles that i prefer rather than uh some kind of like cipher code that kind of thing where there's there's like a more like it was more like a test where there's actually a specific answer that the that needs to be given to to pass the test um i prefer it being more of an environmental piece where yeah like i said there could be multiple ways to get through the players can think of something that the designers myself um might not have ever thought of but that's that's part of our design is we want to um leave room for there to be things that we haven't thought of um mm -hmm. uh so that's that's my design philosophy for puzzles i know other people think differently uh and i don't wouldn't claim to uh have the right answer that everyone should follow but um that's what i find fun anyway yeah for me personally i think yeah. i think the issue is not with puzzles themselves but how but like with a lot of things the execution yeah So taking the, so so given given that given that um, one one of the one of the other I'm um, would you say would you say that this is e that this is equal parts a a setting book and a and a campaign book? Uh, I would say no. I I mean it depends. I don't know what, what what's a setting book, Mildred. Um, <laughs> what's, what's a setting book? Now, this is this is, I. I will de I will define what it, I will define what I mean by a campaign book first, just sure, to okay. just just to help just to help narrow things down. Um, a campaign book is is centered around a spe a specific adventure or or set of adventures, mm -hmm. and all and a lot of the a lot of the N a lot of the NPCs. Um, I, items, what have you, are in are in service to that. Think yeah. of the think of the lettered think of the lettered series modules in the early days of D, of D and D as as a key as a key example of this kind of thing. Yeah. Um. A a a, a um setting book can sometimes le can sometimes lead into a, can sometimes lead into a campaign, but it's about establishing. An area first, filling it with the NPCs and potential story seeds. Yeah, no. So the, the, this is a campaign book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is a campaign book. Um, each, um, it's very much. No, these are the five, um, like well crafted, um, completely inspired by Celtic legend quests that we're uh, giving you. They're set in different areas of Avalon. So each quest. Um, chapter as it were and no, each quest will be multiple chapters but each section of the book for each quest will have um information on the local setting that kind of thing um we will include some hooks here and there for other ideas uh, that you might want to take care of but no this is fundamentally um a campaign book that also features um some player creation options for subclasses for both legends of the Island and fifth edition um mm -hmm. as well as some rules features for fifth edition uh, to allow uh, those GMs to keep up with our uh, journey mechanics, our diplomacy mechanics, that kind of thing that we'll be implementing in, in the campaign. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's a campaign book. Yeah. yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to shift into talking about the legendary profession paths. Mm. Um, how how did the idea for that come come about, and what and um and what and would this be would this be Avalon's equ equivalent to um, prestige classes or or the like? Mm, yeah. So in uh, the Legends of Avalon core uh, book that's already out, um, the way character progression works is that at the beginning of the game you begin. Uh, I'm sure you remember this. You begin as a humble uh, villager. You're just a regular schmo who's looking to make something more of themselves in the world. So the first thing you pick is actually just a profession class. This is uh, like a blacksmith or a shepherd uh, or a merchant. This is just a humble profession uh, that gives you some powers that are most often used for um, in 
the environment or in towns, interacting with other people, that kind of thing. Um, and then later on, as you level up, once you become more familiar with the world and how the game works, then you get to choose whether you want to be a martial character or a spellcasting character. Mm -hmm. uh, there are four classes. There's the uh, warrior, um, the reaver, the mage, and the mystic. And they give you access to uh, fighting styles and, and spellcasting schools. Um, then further into the game, you get to pick a legendary path. Um, and these are tied to your class, but they also allow you to dual class as well. So for example, the primary legendary path for the Reaver um, is the Slayer. These are mm. assassins or hunters. Um, but if you want to become, um, for example, a gladiator, that dual classes you with the warrior. So a warrior mm. and both a Reaver can become a gladiator. Or you can learn how to cast magic um, and you can cross with the mage and become a Fey Touched. Uh, these mm -hmm. are people that have uh, tapped into the Fey. Uh, they grow Fey features, and they can cast spells without other people realizing that they're using magic as like an, in in an innate ability. Right. Uh, so there's like this dual class system there. Um, these legendary paths. There are ten of them, and they're all about enhancing your martial or magic abilities. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's the core. That's the core in the core game. Um, and then when we were um, talking about doing this campaign book, we were thinking about, well, is there anything else we can add to the core game that will be exciting? And a lot of our uh, fans, players of the game, were always wanting more legendary paths. Um, but in my mind, I had already exhausted all the options because each path is either a singular path for one class or a dual class. Um, mm -hmm. And that adds up to 10. There's, there's 10 of them. That's what we made. Um, and I couldn't think of another way to include others. Um, but then... We, uh, I just had this light bulb moment of, oh, wait, we kind of left the professions in the dust. Not in the dust, but we left them behind. The, the legendary paths at the moment, they're all about enhancing your martial or your magic abilities. Well, what about your core profession that you started with to begin with? And then we started thinking, well, what would it be like to have a legendary profession? Um, what would it mean to be a legendary blacksmith um, or a legendary uh, merchant or socialite? Well, what, what does that mean? Um, and that's where these new legendary path ideas came from. These are um, legendary versions of these professions that allow, of, allow you to uh, use your profession in, uh, in fights as well um, and give you abilities that are beyond the, the norm for that kind of thing. So for example, the, um, the Automaficer um, is a um, legendary path for uh, the blacksmith, I mean, for the crafter, which is like blacksmiths and the alchemist. Mm -hmm. And the entire facility allows you to create your own automaton, mm -hmm. um, obviously inspired by the Greek and, and Roman legends. Um, and then there is also the Enwir, which is uh, Welsh for the Neymar. Um, mm -hmm. This is the legendary path for the uh, Bard. And you know what? I can't even remember, dude. <laughs> can't remember. But it's for oh. two impressions. And this is, um, mm -hmm. uh, this is someone who just understands understands the world more than others do on an innate level such that they can see um, and discover other people's true names which gives them power over other beings and entities without having to fight them it's like a pacifist but you can still influence a combat uh, by manipulating others by using their true name um, so that's where this idea came from was like these what if we take professions to the extreme and um, what would that look like yeah mm -hmm. Now, are those go are those going to be the only two legendary paths in, in that book, or do you have others that you're plan that you're planning on developing in the full book? Uh, no, so we're hoping we've currently got four, and our next stretch goal is for the fifth, and that mm -hmm. will be all of them. Um, so it's the Automaphisa, uh, the N Weird that I just mentioned, um, the uh, Philosopher. Um, this is. Uh, someone that can confound uh foes with the uh, okay so this one i was like how are we gonna do philosophy dude like as a legendary thing what does that mean um but i was inspired by the uh fairy queen so the um do, do you know do you know the fairy queen the uh the poem um i it's been a while i do mm. but for the sake but for the sake of people listening could you mm. could you give the cliff notes yeah 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 so this is a epic english poem written in the 1480s, pre-Shakespeare. It's a massive tome, and it, it's, it's an epic. It's, it's, the, the, the opening scenes um, involve a knight 
uh, having a one-on-one -on -one duel with a Medusa-like creature. And this is, this is like a play-by-play -play fight of sword comes down, misses her head, strikes against her shoulder. She leaps it off the wall, starts strangling him with her, with her snake arms and, and, and heads. And then he strangles her back and then chokes her out and then cuts her in half. It's like, this is an epic fantasy book. There's all sorts of quests. It's a really cool... You can see how later fantasy is like inspired or this is where its roots come from, right? Um, and in this wonderful book, although it's a bit difficult to get through because of the, the old English and, and obviously the consistent adherence to the syllable count and the rhyming scheme that uh, Edmund Spencer um, and used. But in one of the quests that these knights go on, um, the, like I said, it's, it's a quite a, a violent uh, poem. There's a lot of fights with dragons, uh, with other monsters. But in one of the quests, the end boss is a hermit who's a nihilist. Um, and he tries to convince the knight to commit suicide, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they have like a philosophical duel. Um, uh, and then I just thought, well, wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that to your enemies? <laughs> if you could just, uh, <laughs> you know, convince them to, to lay their weapons down uh, and to maybe even to end it all. Um, a so, literal diplomancer. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, right away, I got distracted. But yeah, so the the, the Tom Officer, the Enwir, the Philosopher, we just unlocked the Faceless. Um, this is, uh, these are uh, people that have learned how to do what the Fae can do. And where the Druid can shapeshift their entire bodies into other animals, the Faceless can change their appearance uh, to mimic or become anything that they choose to be. Um, that that's a humanoid, so they're like the ultimate spies and uh, charlatans, um, that kind of thing. Um, a little bit inspired by um, I forget their names, but the guys from uh, Game of Thrones. Um, the guys the, from Game of Thrones. Do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, I mean, particularly the guys that could change the faces in the Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. um, the Assassin's Order. I think they're called. Yeah. Uh, I forget anyway. Um, and then the fifth one we're about to unlock is the uh, Paragon. This is just um, us saying, okay, well, when we look at, obviously we're looking at fantastical legends of Celtic mm -hmm. Britain, but if we look at the actual real legends, who is it? And it's like Boudicca and it's Caesar and they didn't have magic powers. They weren't even the best fighters in the world, but they're still legends because they changed history through the wood alone, right? And, and that's because mm -hmm. they're, they're leaguers, they're paragons for a cause. Um, mm -hmm. So the uh, paragon is the uh, legendary profession for the merchants and socializers as you becoming like the ultimate like icon for for your cause um mm -hmm. and uh how you influence others around you to to bring them to your cause uh so yeah that was our take on doing non-magical uh non-martial based um yeah legendary prestige paths yeah so we're super excited by them yeah i think they're quite unique mm -hmm. now with with that in, with that with that kind of thing in mind there when it comes to when it comes to writing modules, um, mm -hmm. there's always there's 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 always the risk that that ends up that you run of get of um, having to strike a balance mm -hmm. between between not between not making things too narrow, i.e., railroading, but also not but also not making things too broad because then the then the module becomes sprawling. Unless you unless you want to do a hex crawl, which is perfectly fine, but that's a that's a whole different um, ballpark. So, in this in this case, how how do you um how do you make sure that there's still that even if, even if there's a movement from A to B that there's st that there's still um, room for player and GM um, personalization within that path? Yeah. So I. Um, my design philosophy is, is uh, like mini sandboxes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like to set up uh, situations and environments in which there's um, a lot of flexibility and um, decisions to be made on the outcome, uh, but you're still within this smaller box as part of a greater system. So for example, the heist. Um, where I don't think we're currently planning to map out the entire Raxian city. Uh, we're going to be mapping out the local area around the compound um, and including um, 
uh, a bunch of different ways um, that you can access to the compounds, uh, a bunch of different NPCs that live nearby, like a local uh, fence, uh, like the underground scene uh, for the thieves, um, the local um, administration that's in charge of like um, uh, like urban planning, uh, who might have some plans um, for the compounds, um, all the private hired guards that work there. Uh, there'll be a tavern nearby um, full of people you might be able to meet. Um, so we have all these different nodes of interest that the players will likely want to consider and think about. And then we have the compound itself, uh, which has its own uh, structure and rules and, and characters and um, uh, schedule uh, and timing um, and that kind of thing. And, and you have a clear objective, which is still the MacGuffin that's inside this compound. And you have a certain time to do it with because the, uh, the artifact is going to leave um, the island at some point. It's going to be uh, taken away. It's only there for a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then how you achieve it, well, that's up to you guys. Uh, we've given you all the tools. We've given you more tools than actually you could possibly need. Um, there's a bunch of intrigue about uh, the guy who owns the place. Um, there's currently a uh, bathhouse being installed. Um, so there's all these different kinds of inns. Uh, there's going to be a uh, meeting, uh, a dinner, where he's going to show off the artifact at some point. Um, so it, it's it's all there. Um, but still, how the players uh, tackle the problem, well, that's going to be up to them. Um, and that's where the flexibility comes in. And that's why you need the game master, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the players can come up with all sorts of nonsense. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's why you need the human brain there to to, to arbitrate it all. Um, but like at the same time though, we're not, it's not going to become a, uh, um, I was going to say like a, like a retail sim game where we're going to have the rest of the, the city mapped out and then um, you can start investing in properties and like, well, no, we're, that's, that's not what the campaign's about. That's not what the quest is about. We have this one area, this is where the focus is, uh, but inside that playground, you can do whatever you want. So each quest kind of has that same uh, design to it where, yes, the, the the campaign is restricted because, well, we have a story to tell. We have this mm -hmm. quest that you can go on. That's where the fun is. But how you play with the fun, how you play with the toy, well, that, that, that's up to you. So um, that's our philosophy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went when I went through the page and I saw the blurbs that you had on each of the um mod, on each of the ad adventures, each of the chapters, if you will, yeah, um, I did see the 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 fact that you had listed the touchstones, i.e., um, i.e. the the kind of popular media that would be inspirations, as well mm -hmm. as inspiring Celtic legends. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have plans for some sort of Appendix N le like um like segment that goes into some of those legends into a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah. So we do. So we're also uh, making an art book um, for the the products and this. Um, so so yeah, in the main campaign book, we're going to list them um, and have an appendix as well. But the art book is where it's more like a making of um, where we will include like all the concept art um, notes from the artists about. Um, their ideas and thoughts about creating the work. And then we're also going to delve deeper into the actual legends and folklore and describe how the campaign um, story was created and where it comes from. Um, because, yeah, not only are the quests inspired by these Celtic legends, but the overall story of the Fairy Queen is kind of an amalgamation between two uh, tales, two particular Celtic mm -hmm. women, uh, one of them being uh, King Arthur's mother. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so we'll be going into there in quite deep and like, yeah, okay, this is what this legend's about and these are the parts of it that we took together uh, and what parts we changed or what parts we get the same and how we link them together with this other Celtic legend to create this quest. Um, so yeah, that's all going to be in the art book and we're going to go quite deep, I think. Yeah, I'm kind of excited about it. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And the other, qu the other question that I had on that, I had on that front is... Well, it's it's kind it's kind of answered because I was going I was going to ask about um about for about further reading, but mm -hmm. I'd like to sh I'd like to shift a bit into the uh into the five E end of things because mm -hmm. you 
obvious, obviously, there's a there's a fair amount of subclasses that you're putting in, and mm-hmm. we and um, <laughs> there's no there's no way we could get to to um all to all of that to all of them, mm-hmm. but could but could you give me a few examples of some of the subclasses you're you're putting in and what they br- and what they would bring to the table for five E players? Yeah, yeah. So these so the additional pro- legendary professions um, that uh, we're introducing to Legends of Avarnum. Uh, so the ones I mentioned earlier, the Enwyr, the the Faceless, the Automaphyser, those ones are coming as well. And then the others that we're introducing are the legendary paths that already existed in Legends of Avarnum. Um, and they're being adapted into 5e. Um, and yep, I can name a few. So I mentioned the Slayer earlier, for example, mm-hmm. um, and the Fate Touched we mentioned earlier as well. Uh, and the Gladiator, we mentioned earlier as well, they're coming in. Um, one that's always fun is the Tayli, because people will see that and they have no idea what it means. Um, the Tayli, spelled T-E-U-L-U. So the Tayli um, is a um, role that existed in Celtic um, Britain, in, in, in Celtic Wales. Um, and it is the, the role of the chieftain's bodyguard. These, these are um, his or her... Uh, closest uh, allies, uh, friends, companions, and, and warriors. Uh, and Tayli literally means in Welsh today, still family. Um, and it's these are those that you choose to be kin with you, even though they're not kin. Um, uh, and they have the role of being protector um, and hunter and, uh, and soldier. Um, and that's going to be a subclass for the ranger uh, in fifth edition. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh what else do we have we can talk about the uh oath of the picts so in lives in the Rana, we have the swin pict um this is when you imagine celtic warrior you imagine the uh the naked body painted uh um uh warrior charging at you with with axes and sword um in legends of Valen, uh those paints on their body uh are are worth something uh they're they're magical and allow you to um, cast spells onto your body, kind of like spell tattoos. I think mm-hmm. um, other uh, maybe physician supplements have, have done that kind of thing before. Um, and the swim pit can summon the weapons uh, from these spells crafted onto their bodies, and they can cast spells by hitting their foes. <clears throat> um, and that's what the oath of picks is all about. And we're uh, making that a paladin subclass, um, and we just. Uh, like the idea of the uh, in in Avalon, the, uh, the the paladin subclass is the uh, uh, half naked warrior devotees um, uh, that um, devote themselves to the gods and do so by painting themselves with these intricate symbols that represent them. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people think of that as being like the berserker or, or the barbarian, um, mm-hmm. but that role is is, is a sacred role um, to the Valak people. Um, yeah. And of course, we give the barbarian the uh, gladiator. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure there'll be no complaints there. Yeah. And with and with that with that in mind, I, th- I think there are also a few other systems that that you have in plan for have planned for the five end of things to kind of to as you put as you put it inflict a- Avalon on five e. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is our um, parlay system, which is diplomacy. Um, it's all about uh, figuring out. So th- this this isn't just for every conversation. This is for when um, you're trying to convince uh, an NPC to do something that they currently don't want to do, um, and you're doing it without violence. Um, you're doing it with words and reason and cunning, um, and it's quite a simple system, really. But every character will have um, a motivation, a virtue, and a flaw uh, associated with them. And um, your job is to figure out why they um, won't do what it is that you want them to do, and then persuade them um, by either persuading them why that reason isn't good enough, or give them another reason why um, that they would want to do that overcomes their own reason. Um, but a key part of that is figuring out who they are, um, what's their virtue, what's their flaw, and then leveraging it against them. 
once you figure out how they tick, then you can use that against them um, uh, to advantage your checks. Um, but the, the key part of this is that the NPC only has a certain amount of patience um, and that dwindles, um, especially if you're offensive or um, do things in the wrong way or fail your checks. Uh, and then eventually, um, if you don't do so great, then the character uh, will try and shut down the conversation because they've had enough of you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, a great little system that gives, it kind of empowers the GMs to be able to say, okay, well, I, I know when this is going to end. I know what the fail state is. Um, uh, cause I've, I found myself that a lot of those kind of, um, situations, the players would just keep trying and trying and trying different tactics, different tactics until, um, they get yeah. what they want. <laughs> yeah. The, um, uh, I, I don't remember, I don't recall who said this, but I remember someone talking about, um, conversations in video game, um, R RPGs and comparing it to an interrogation. Yeah. Where you're exhausting every you're exhausting every single possible outcome, yeah, um, to get the to get the maximum amount of information, or just to be a completionist, yeah, and yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Of course, the 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 sole except the sole exception to this kind of thing is stuff like um, stuff like Alpha Protocol, and there hasn't been a whole lot of games that have done that since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, that's exactly my feeling as well. And of course, the, the counter to that is relying on the GM to like say, okay, this is this is enough. Uh, but it's hard to know when that is, whereas the system gives you like a concrete, no, this is how the game works. Um, and once the characters run out of patience, well, that's not the GM's fault, that's the player's fault for wasting their time, uh, for going down the wrong avenues and not for being tactful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it moves the burden away from the... It, uh, GM fiat to uh, game rules that everyone uh, follows and understands. Um, and obviously, we've played it with Nevada now for years, and uh, we love it, so um, it's coming across. Um, and it's especially important for the, the games, the quest, uh, the politics quest, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, another key part is journey, journey mechanics. Um, you're going to be wandering across the Valen. Um, this uh, system re relies on supply, um, food, and random encounters. Um, and it will involve um, <laughs> modifying quite a few parts of 5th edition because um, the problem with 5th edition journeys, um, maybe people don't realize this, but the, the real problem with 5th edition is that nothing lasts from day to day in that game um, because once you rest, all is forgiven. Um, all your spells come back, almost all your health comes back. There's no consequences that last from one day to another. Um, also, I we're going to have to modify ranges somewhat because, uh, and some spells because they completely invalidate the need for food while traveling. Um, that, 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 that system is kind of, uh, taken journey mechanics and kind of take it back around the, the back of the shed and, and, and uh, giving mm -hmm. it the shot, to be honest. <laughs> so we're going to have to, um, work a little bit to, uh, make journeys an exciting part of the campaign because when we play in the violin, it's sometimes it's the best part is, is getting is getting there in the first place. Um, all sorts of things happen. Uh, it's exciting. It's interesting. There's decisions to be made, um, and we want to yeah empower players to have that same experience in fifth edition yeah as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final main uh, mechanic that we'll be introducing is uh, fate cards. It kind of ties some of them together as well. Uh, this is like a ticking clock mechanic that's used in exploration and other tense scenes um, that pushes the players to uh, get a move on when, when things are dire, because things will get worse if you stick around. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've played or know much about Torchbearer. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been around the block with Torchbearer. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of inspired by that, but it's less uh, uh, punishing, <laughs> less grinding you to dust. Um, but um, that system was definitely inspired by Torchbearer. Yeah. Um, Although it's not, it's, 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 it's more random. It's like a, uh, in Torchbearer, it's, it's very concrete. The, this is going to happen to you after this amount of time and you will be ground to dust um, in our, our fate cards. Is, there's a chance that something bad will happen to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, yes, you want to keep moving, but you don't yeah. know you're going to be ground to dust in three turns. <laughs> Torchbearer does. Yeah. But... With that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? Mm. Yeah, we're aiming for uh, 
Last I checked, 250. Um, mm-hmm. And in my head now, I'm just like doing the mouse to double check. Yeah, it's like 40 pages per adventure plus extra for setting and the, the class mechanics and the other rules. I'll be honest, Mildred, it's probably going to go over. Let's be honest. It'll probably be more closer to 275, um, I think. Um, but I, I I prefer brevity. I don't want to um, make it bulkier and larger than it needs to be just for play, uh, page count's sake. Um, for example, the, the Avalon rulebook, that's only 250 pages, and that includes all the character creation rules, all the world setting, um, all the um, game rules, and a very, honestly, I would say substantial uh, game master section as well, uh, teaches you how to run games in general, that kind of stuff. And we did it all in 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 quite a small book, really. And that's because, um, yeah, I, I, it's important to be efficient. Um, and I I come from a scientific background, um, and I hate writing science articles because you have to be you have to explain everything over and over and over again, and really uh, um, elaborate. Um, and in my uh, RPG life, I prefer to do the opposite <laughs> and then get to the point. This is what you need to know. Here it is. Um, and yeah, that's our, our writing philosophy. Mm-hmm. And with the, with that and with that in mind, I'm 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 certainly going to be looking forward to seeing how how it develops. And I do I do hope that some of the uh, remaining stretch goals end up end up getting hit. Yeah, thanks. Uh oh. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to <laughs> come all the way up to my to come to my temple once once again. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mildred. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, always appreciate the uh, temple being open. It's just fun mm-hmm. to step in when uh, when you're about. Yeah, and and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.